welcome everyone to another broadcast of the Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past broadcasts are podcasts. Pick them up at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions and comments. Hit us up at dj at artistfirst.com. And now here they are, Michael and Margaret Lines. And thank you very much, C-Man. And I am Michael Lyons. <laughs> and I'm Margaret. And she is Margaret. I always say that. She's Margaret. As if she would be anyone else. Oh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, and um, I would say, Margaret, that this present moment doesn't exist. Hmm. It doesn't? <laughs> well, it doesn't exist to the subject of our show tonight. Ah. I see. Okay. And the subject of our show tonight is, uh, which we've talked about, you know, in on past shows, is our friend the ego. Mm. Tully, Tully had a lovely way of putting it. Um, you know, he said that, that the present moment, which is all that we that any of us actually have, and, and as he says in his very little quaint German way, often overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would say uh, habitually, you know, almost willfully overlooked um, by most um, beings who are in existence today. Uh, and maybe through no fault, mm-hmm. mm. Be- because these individuals, and let's just say most people are in, acting in an unconscious state. You could almost say through no fault of their own, but the fault is is in the fact that that their consciousness has been um, subsumed, at least, by an all. Um, I don't want to say an all present ego, but by an overbearing ego, by an ego which has, uh, from its perch inside of the consciousness, because it is a piece of small piece of the consciousness has just set up this megaphone where it says I am you Mm -hmm. Uh, and we we had a show some time back about you know that voice in your head which uh, oftentimes is the ego and the voice in your head which is the ego needs one thing it needs someone to listen so what's listening what's listening is all the rest of you although the ego can sometimes break itself into multiple pieces and have an argument with itself, you know, and as Toy also says, because he has a lovely way with words, you know, you start addressing yourself in the first person or in the second person. You always do this and you always do that. And I shouldn't <laughs> have done this. And I, but I couldn't help it. And then you started having an argument, you know, excusing yourself for the, for the behavior or whatever situation was. Well, you wind up explaining to yourself your behavior and you're sitting there going, Who, who's talking? Who's talking? I couldn't help who's, it. You saw they it? cut me off. I had to get mad. It's like, it, And all of this is going on completely in complete and utter silence from, any, from the perspective of anyone else in the world. You're just sitting there with a dumb look on your face. Uh, and yet you're having this involved, uh, you know, trial, if you will. There's a judge, jury, executioner, and, and a witness, and you're all of them uh, who's going through a trial uh, about about what? And this is really the subject of our, of our talk tonight about the ego, about something which is not happening now, <laughs> which is, is in a, an interesting thing. Um, you know, scientists will tell you that there is something called time. And then really good scientists will tell you that there really isn't something called time, but it sort of manifests itself out of who knows what. We won't go into the details. But the the ego, um, you know, Margaret uh, came up with this postulate. The ego, in some ways, manifests time because the ego needs time. The ego needs the past. The ego needs the future. And the ego needs one thing entirely more than either of those two things. It needs to ignore the present (laughs) as much as it possibly can because the present is not where the ego likes to hang out. Well, 
Okay. If you look at what you were speaking about before, where there's a part of you demanding an answer from a part of you. One part is, is demanding an answer out of the other. You you are demanding an answer out of yourself <laughs> for something that you've either done or not done. So you sit there and you go, wait a minute, how is that even possible? And how many how many voices are arguing here? So when you realize that your consciousness is the one that's actually giving the juice for this space to exist, because consciousness has got to give space for those voices for them to be expressed. But you're not aware of that, really, until you you stop for a moment and ask yourself those questions. Like, wait a minute, who am I answering to? And normally, most people go into, well, I always heard that voice growing up, or the voice of my mother or my father or whatever. And that's when you realize that those voices have been internalized and never resolved. So if you are present in the moment of now, there is no space for any of that. And why? Why is there no space for any of those voices when you're completely present? And it has everything to do with allowing um, the fullness of your consciousness to be in that moment. If it is the ego speaking, then there's this box that's got to be created for the ego. The ego itself cannot encompass the moment of now. It's too big. Exactly. Just to unpack that, I mean, that's wonderful. It's exactly correct. Um, The ego needs a box. And it needs a box that has arrows on it, the past and the future and things that, that I worry about and things that are going to happen. And oh, it needs a box. And in, in the moment of now, it doesn't fit. It can't fit in the box. In fact, it, to the extent that you become that you, the, the you, the greater you, the greater I becomes aware of the moment of now. You, you almost do, you do something amazing because the moment of now has no time. There is no time which is the moment of now. However, it is. It is, it is incontrovertibly happening all the time. But the ego wants to parse it. It wants to put the, put the box around it. This happened yesterday. That happened last week. This is going to happen tomorrow. This is going to happen mm. two years from now. I'm going to be this. Mm. I'm going to be that. All those things are in relationship to one sort of vastness, the vastness that it cannot encompass, which is time, which is the moment of now. And ego, the ego needs to tear now into these shreds to fit, fit them into the box and give it handles. You, you can't... Um, you know, to go to your example, you can't have an argument with yourself about the moment of now because it just is. It's so. It the isness of now has totally said the isness of now is so overwhelming that just to try and encompass it silences everything else. It silences thought, ego. It, it silences your um, your your constructs and makes you into the oneness, into the eternal. And into the timeless moment of now, uh, totally gives the the image of, of a cross. Now people say, "Oh, the cross." No, what he what he means by the cross is that there's a there's a vertical dimension, which has no actual dimension, which is the moment of now, and then there's a horizontal dimension, 
which people say, well, that's got to be time. Not exactly. That's where the ego plays around moving back and forth, trying to shred it into time. Uh, in an egoless sense, there is no time. Uh, but when you throw the ego in, all of a sudden, time sort of manifests because the ego needs yesterday to say, oh, I was this. And it's tomorrow, say, I will be that. Yes, when your focus, your conscious, when your consciousness focus turns away from being in the moment and being open, you actually have to close down and narrow your field. And what you're narrowing on is you're concentrating on what the ego is telling you. And when you focus on that, when you listen to that, you are no longer present in the moment. You are listening to all the reasonings and the uh, analyses and the projections and the fears and the worries and the hopes and the dreams of the ego. And I look at that and you realize that, you know, there's many people who that basically describes their whole existence. They have not encountered what it means to be in the now since they were babies. So to return back to, you know, people say, oh, I want to return back to the simpler time. What was your simpler time? It's a point where you didn't have to consider time. You just were. Your eyes opened and you took in what was there. Time complicates things because it forces you to make up, as you said, divisions or concerns. I'm concerned about you know, oh, what we're what we're going to make for dinner, or what we're eating, and so that's the box of okay, this is the foods we have to to think about, mm. or what what we need to do in order to get those foods, and then having to organize your world so that you can actually go to the store and get the food. It's it it this becomes a whole ego trip and and people think an ego trip is just blowing up your your um, concept of yourself it's like no you don't understand the trip is you're going on this journey of a story that's being told by your ego hmm. fascinating yeah and, and you know to go back to what you where you said it, it is it is the state that you know um, somebody referred to around the age of seven as quote unquote the age of reason, but it might also be appropriately termed as sort of the age of the ego, um, and it maybe it's earlier than that. But there there's this, there's a point at which um, a human being's uh, ego, their internal voice, starts to speak. There's a point. Before that time, and as you said, when, when you were born, when you were incarnated upon this plane, you were born in a state of being. You didn't think about, well, time meant really nothing. Uh, it, it, yes, there, of course, events happen. Events happen in a sequence. The sequence could be called time. But you weren't thinking about yesterday or tomorrow certainly not thinking about what I want to be and what others think of me and how, you know, I didn't do this good yesterday, but I will do it tomorrow. And no, you won't because you never do things right. And da -da. <laughs> that wasn't happening in your head. But yet all of us now can say and think of and remember times when all that was happening in our heads, when we were reproaching ourselves or, or aspiring within or 
disappointed in ourselves, you know, and, and if you just think about the construct language, the construct, who is disappointed in who? It's, it's all you, but yet you can say something, I was so disappointed in myself and I told myself that I was going to do that better next time. And you're thinking to yourself, and, and they usually, this isn't something that you even, you know, when somebody describes this to you, you can hear this conversation, but this is what's going on. They're just kind of externalizing it at the moment. They're, they're literally talking to themselves in the first, second, and third persons about what happened, what happened, or what's going to happen. And the present moment of now is almost, it's not just ignored, it's excluded from that conversation. Right. It's the truth. The full perception is not there. And the world that is being believed and focused on is this small story that's being told. And it is a fantasy. Yes. I mean, it's like when you're reading a bedtime story to the kids and they're all lying there like, okay. And suddenly they become engaged in this story and their minds are flying here and there. You go, all right. This is just a story. But you can begin to see how their consciousness is focusing on what was being told, how people felt, what they could do to solve a problem. Just fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, it's, it's an essential human thing to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we, we all enjoy stories. Yes, and I was going to say, I don't want people to take away from this conversation that you shouldn't be doing that. Um, listening to a story can be in the present moment. You can, you can enjoy your memories. You can, you can enjoy thinking about a complicated problem. You can enjoy thinking about something which you're going to do next week. All those things are fine. The present moment contains all that too. It becomes a um, an unconscious event when instead of it being the present moment within which you are remembering a past moment, uh, in consciousness, in awareness, that that the present moment is completely hijacked, or rather, it's it's almost it's put into into a non-event. Your your ego doesn't like, you know, to put it bluntly, the present moment. In fact, it, it literally says, oh, I hate what's going on right now. I want it to be this. I want it to be that. I, oh, it was so nice last time. And oh, if it only had been this. And if I'd only done that. And if they hadn't done this. If I hadn't done that, I'd be this. And they, all that mess, mm. which is within many, many, many people, um, and, and that's why you walk up to somebody, you'll start a conversation with them. You'll say, hi, how are you doing? They're like, oh, rah, 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 rah. because you're interrupting their caucus. <laughs> They've got a Congress going on in there and you're coming in out of nowhere. Like, I don't, I don't have time for you. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself about something that happened three years ago. What's the matter with you? But you can't, you see, I'm upset. And you're like, oh, you know, I bit my head off. I'm going to run away. But the, the point being is that, yeah, they were, they were completely, totally, um, involved in, a, in an emotional and mental level within themselves and unaware. They, they probably didn't even see you coming. They had no idea that the present moment was happening. Uh, as, as somebody might have said, you know, uh, uh, a lightning bolt could have fallen from the sky and they wouldn't even notice. They just kept right on walking. Because why? Because the present moment doesn't matter. Well, it's been... The perfect example right now is when people are walking on the street on their phones. Oh. And they could step into the street because they don't even realize. All I know is that there's a step there and they keep going. And they're not even looking at, at the oncoming traffic or what's going on around them. Situational awareness has gone completely mm. 
because they're so much into whatever's unfolding as a story on their screen. And that's what I find fascinating. That is an excellent example of how your consciousness gets hijacked. You know, they always talk about hijacked screens and that happen when you're on your computer. It's like, well, it's become really personal now when it's on your phone. You do you understand that your consciousness is being hijacked. And I think you said this earlier, it's also being parasitized in one way. The, the ego is living off of the, you said it, the consciousness is giving all its power to the ego. The ego is living as a parasite off of the consciousness and, and willfully, purposefully with a existential, it needs to exist this way with an existential urgency. It wants to keep the consciousness focused on it yes. to, to feed it energy, to yes. feed it attention. We, we said it earlier. I'll just repeat it again. When the ego is talking, it needs, it doesn't need it. It, 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 it it requires as a function of its existence the energy of awareness to listen to it even when the ego is arguing back and forth the fact that the reason that that there is an awareness of an argument going on is that there is an awareness within which all these voices are yelling at each other the awareness is what they're yelling to even if it sounds like they're talking to each other or or trying to you know berate you who are they berating that's the awareness that comes out of this the ego this little tiny well it's, there's no space and time to it but this thing these um what does totally call them these uh entities you know uh have a, a certain amount of of life they they are a cogent mental form they're an energy form i think he says they're an energy form in other words they they you you said it earlier this is the voice of my father or my mother whomever these are these become living constructs parasitic living constructs that have have characteristics they sound a certain way they have a mental um there's a reaction within your being when this thing starts or that thing starts it, it requires an identity it sometimes hijacks as you said your your own um uh your your own i-ness it, it wants to say this is what you are you're bad you're good you're a loser you're a winner you're you know it, it wants to well, define you well it wants to to tell you exactly who you should be hmm. according to what the ego patterning has been uh, poured into your head. Hmm. You know, whoever poured it into your head, whether it was a family member or society or a culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or work, hmm. whatever the requirement is, um, you'll note that the ego will take hold of it and have a patterned response. Whether it's for or against, it doesn't matter. It's still a set patterned response. Mm. And the need for the consciousness is to make note of it and say, oh, this is always the way I seem to react when this comes up. Hmm. Mm. And how much energy are you actually pouring into it? Because there's a certain level of exhaustion <laughs> that's acquainted with it. And you have to realize that if you feel exhausted, where did all that energy go to? Exactly. You are actually feeding this, what I would call, um, a... Um, Oh, it's going to sound awful, but uh, a malignant cancerous growth. I don't think that's too far off Be because the ego does wish to grow mm -hmm. and, and like a to malignancy takes energy and gives back very little. Well, it wants to take over completely 
irregardless, no, that's not a word, regardless Hmm. of whether or not the host is uh, going to be hurt by it. Exactly. No, uh, there's the ego like a cancer. And people say, my ego is not a cancer. Well, uh, but the point is, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's defending itself. The ego also defends itself. But um, like a cancer, it uh, it grows. It has um, its own agenda. It wants to hijack your energy, your awareness, your and the 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 ego. It sounds so terrible. The ego isn't a terrible thing. But it is a thing. It is, it is something which um, has its own survival mechanism, like a cancer. They, you know, people, um, when doctors who treat cancers will tell you that the cancer will, uh, will metamorphosize and, and learn, you know, oh, this treatment is, is, a, is effective for a little while, but then it stops being effective. Why? Because the cancer has, has, has learned how to get around it. And you'll say, well, that's just a, a tropism or something like that. It doesn't matter. Mm. But, but the ego is a lot smarter than that. The ego, the ego is as smart as you are. So it, it uses all of your own, um, your own energy, your own awareness, your own well, not awareness, but your own your own mental faculties, your own emotional faculties, to prop itself up, to make itself stronger all the tools you've learned to use mentally, mm. how to manage things, how to organize things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, come to bear when the ego wields them in order to get what it wants. Very, and that's, that's perfect because it wants these things. It, it wants attention and energy. It, 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 it is hungry for your attention. It, it, it will both command it and demand it. It will annoy you until you pay attention to it. Mm. Uh, and then Margaret said earlier, um, it, will, it will rise up complete with a story and with an emotional charge and with uh, a whole set of, re- of pre-planned reactions or pre-programmed reactions and and charge into your awareness, uh, taking it l- literally by surprise and bowl you over, bowl over the present moment and take you 20 years in the past when X, Y, Z happened. And remember how I felt. And, and it has the power also of memory. It, it can make you smell what you smelled then and feel the fear that you felt then and feel the anger that you felt then and and really transport you from where? From now to then, to to something that isn't happening now. <laughs> if you realize that the story that it comes up with is actually the lock to keep your attention at a certain feeling or a certain memory or a certain... so that it will begin to be fed by all the reaction that that memory or or incident brings. So I remember reading, I wish I could remember where I I read it, but when you have an emotional reaction, you feel it completely for 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then you're supposed to let it go. We were meant to be able to feel our emotions, Mm. but only for 90 seconds. Mm. So if you have the appropriate story, you'll be able to lock that feeling in continually and play it over and over and over again, Mm. bringing up that same stress response, whatever it may be and feeding uh, the, the ego by feeding your focus on this memory. Hmm. And a lot of people feel like they're trapped there. Yes. This is why I say it's 
the story is like a lock to keep your consciousness there. As you just said, you know, that whatever the period of time is, whether it's 90 seconds or whatever, that period of time, that energy is gone. It's exhausted. It's eaten. And and you will exhaust yourself. You feel trapped. You feel um, tired. You feel used. You feel as though um, empty. you know, emptied. You you feel you feel as though you're being sucked dry by by this by whatever it is. It, your awareness is vast, but the 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 ego preys upon the limited resources. Your attention. Your um, emotional and physical energy, your, um, you know, the stress hormones, uh, the, the, the literal moment of the day that you're in, it wants to hijack and take you back into the story. And therefore you can't replenish. Uh, if you stay in the box, in the trap and re-triggering over and over and over again, the only thing that will stop you is exhaustion. You'll fall into a heap, you'll fall into your bed exhausted and frazzled and unable to, um, you to under, understand why you're so, un, and you may not sleep even. Right. That's true. You won't, you won't be so relaxed enough to even close your eyes. You know what we should do? Mm. We should take a, we should take a break and go back to the studio and relax and close our eyes for 30, whatever amount of time it is. And we'll come back on the other side. We'll talk more about ego. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series, is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back. And the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack, and time is definitely not on their side, as they battle against their enemies' undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him, or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book One, Destroyer's Blood, and the new release, Book Two, First Blood, today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e-tailers. Moonstones and Murder Real murderers need a heart of stone. Meet Maggie and Mike Hearthstone, parents of twin boys, entrepreneurs, and now empty nesters. Mike is retired, not by choice, from his position as chief of police in the picturesque resort town of Hamilton. And now his wife Maggie and her shop, The Cozy Crystal, are their only source of income. When a mysterious killing interrupts Hamilton's famous Springfield Park rock show, the townsfolk, the cozy crystal, and their lives are rocked to the core. Can Mike and Maggie figure out who is behind the murderous deeds before the town comes crashing down around them? A touch of romance, a little mayhem, and a whole lot of suspense, along with plenty of comedy and thrills galore. Get your crystal magnifying glass out. It's time for some Moonstones and Murder. Available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, and other fine e-tailers in ebook and paperback. Out soon on Audible. Get your copy today. There is a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir. There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read. Just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. 
From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, the fat man gets out of bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. Hi, this is Hannah Ruth from the band Wild Hum. Check out our new Americana Soul CD, Wild Hum, at our website, W-I-L-D-H-U-M music.com and you are listening to the artist first radio network thank you thanks for joining us on the soul of the everyman on the artist first radio network Back to your hosts, Michael and Margaret Lons. And we have spent the last two and a half minutes in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have. And uh, we all can do that, and we all should do that. Um, and I think we, we, we've been talking tonight about about the ego and, and really about the fact that the ego, um, which comes in for a lot of abuse because the ego unfortunately, is the part of our awareness who tries to hijack the rest of it. Uh, but yet, um, a, a functioning, a healthy uh, awareness of healthy human being, um, a being, um, can have an ego. It, it is not that the ego is something that you need to expunge or, or you know, kill. But what you need to do is... is is sever the ego's parasitic relationship with the awareness. Uh, we were talking last half hour about the fact that the, the ego, um, it, it doesn't know, um, it, it, it unfortunately doesn't understand, or your, your unconscious ego doesn't understand that, that uh, it is not all things. It is not you. The ego wants to tell you that it is you, that, that all things are the ego, that, that the I is the, the eye of the ego is all the eyes there are, uh, that the present moment does nothing but serve the ego's um, need for attention. And in the attention that you give the ego, it wants to drag you to the most fertile fields, the most emotionally charged, the most uh, energetic, because that allows it to feed and allows it to um, to engage you at that level, at the at the I awareness level. And I just wanted to go back to our theme in a moment. But but the, what the ego needs for all those things, and what we what we said here, and what Tully was talking about, is it needs time. Right. It does need time in order to um, create a field in which it can function in, because uh, without time. What you have is now, and it can't function there. So if you, how do I say this? When you get so involved with, everyone says, well, you know, you have to, you have to live your day. You need your, your ego in order to organize things and bring things along. We're not saying that. That doesn't happen. But to understand that the ego has a place that you could decide where it needs to fit in. Because it is the active part of your self that manages uh, a step by step organization. Now, I know a lot of people who want to organize their day according to their day timer completely. Okay, between this hour and this hour, this 15 minutes, you know, I can talk to you. Um, I'll pencil you in. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you're in a doctor's office, you can certainly see that because there's a high demand. Uh, people wanting to come in, but it doesn't 
need to be that way when you're dealing with just a step-by-step on everyday life unless you've overloaded your schedule. And that's one awareness I'd say that um, would be a good thing to examine. How loaded is your schedule? Do you have time where you can just be? Have you set aside just small snippets or do you take your moments where you can just be and not feel the stress of, say, the workplace? Just let's face it, the workplace, there's plenty of stress there. Um, dealing with people is a big stressor. Because people can be triggered by so many things. And suddenly you are in a moment where you've got to manage somebody else's problem. Well, their their ego. Mm -hmm. Or their unconsciousness. Right. And it's always interesting because you realize what triggers you and what doesn't at that moment. There are certain things, certain boundaries that get crossed and then the emotions start rising and when the emotions rise, it usually rises with a story. So when you can see what the emotion is and what the story that accompanies it, what that is unfolding, realizing that you're being locked into that cage again where you're going to be feeling whatever was triggered, anger or uh, fear. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a constant uh, underlying emotion for that time period. And for me, I'm sitting here going, oh, if it's more than 90 seconds, I realize that the story is, is there. Well, I mean, I, this is this is perfect because, in essence, the um, what when you when you when you make space in your awareness for the ego and make space in your awareness for the story or for the thing that's coming up, what you do when you make space, you get to stand back. You, the awareness, the consciousness, can uh, witness. I think um, we we talk a little bit about the little monk um, who witnessed because of his ability to expand his awareness. He was able to witness something which would always have um, made him uh, lose his consciousness when he was younger. He had a a, a fear. He was able to Mm -hmm. stand back in awareness and witness the fear and the story and the font of emotion that comes up and all the thoughts that are associated with it, and the cage that it wants to lock you in. Well, if you stood, if you stand back in awareness and can see this coming up, now, uh, human beings as we are, it's, it's difficult to stop the, the it's, you can't suppress the coming up. The trigger happens. The thing rises up, you know, the, the story with the thoughts and the emotions and everything ready to go, and it opens up its door wide, for you to step in and lose consciousness, to get bound up into the story for however long it will, and it'll try to keep you there for as long as it possibly can, out of the conscious, out of the present moment. You you have the moment though prior to that, the moment of decision, and that's what we're trying to um, make ourselves aware of. We are aware that there's the story, there's the emotion, there's all the things. It has this giant big open door. You still, in awareness, have a decision to make. Do I engage? The Buddhists say the thought comes up, it rolls across the table. Don't engage. Don't pick up the marble. Don't grasp this story. And do what? Make it you. Make, you know, put yourself into the story. You have the moment of now to say, there's a story going on and like a, like a radio or a TV, just change that channel or tune that dial or just say, not right now. 
and and then you know if you give yourself the 90 seconds it just fades away it's just like oh that story didn't work and it just kind of dissipates if you go in it could go on for a year <laughs> you know you could be mad for a year well um, if you if you engage in the thought or the uh, experience that's rolling across your field of attention and you reach out with mental fingers and grab it and engage it and bring it to your eyes and and enter into that bubble then you're in that bubble if you allow it you see it and just allow it to roll past your field of vision and watch as it just drops off the table that's your consciousness Observing. And, and once you built the space, the consciousness has a space. Uh, totally calls it spaciousness, but truly the consciousness has a space. It's, it's as large as you want it to be. The ego wants it to be tiny, but it's as large as you want it to be. You you see these ego fonts, these ego entities, pop up. They're like, come on, play with me. Let's. It'll be fun, and not that we're going to drag you into twenty years in the past and tell you all the things you did wrong. But there's this figurative engagement or this, this desire to engage with you. It really wants to engage with you and take you over, take over your conscious awareness. And once you're inside, Margaret just said, once you're inside, that's it. You're in for uh, until you're exhausted, until you come to the end of it, where you just don't have anything more. You can fall out again. Uh, to, once you Once you've engaged you lose your ability to do anything but the story. You, you may find yourself saying things you didn't mean to say and doing things you didn't mean to do and feeling things you didn't want to feel. This should sound familiar because this happens to people all the time. Something happens. Guy cuts you off in traffic or somebody comes by and dumps something on your desk or you know you trip over a rug and boom, you're off. You're always tripping. You're so clumsy. These people always cut me off. I never get... You're gone. You're no longer you, whomever you may be, in the present moment. You're wherever ego wants to take you. And, and it should sound pretty familiar. Like, yeah, that happens to me all the time. I'm terrible at this. You know, it's, just, it's, it's so um, seductive and easy because that voice has a tremendous affinity because it's it's you or somebody you love or somebody who's really close to you. It can really get inside you because it really is inside you. <laughs> it's inside you. <laughs> yes. And the words are always telling because it's words that have brought a very strong reaction to start. Mm. Like, uh, I told you so, that... Phrase, I told you so. We all know that one. We all roll our eyes when we hear that one. Mm. But we do know that phrase when it's been said to you and you've made a mistake on something and someone's coming up to you saying, well, I was trying to stop you kind mm -hmm. of thing. And they don't even, it's not even gracious enough to say, I didn't want you to experience that. I told you so. It's very self-righteous. I'm right and you're wrong. Oh, yeah. So to understand that when it comes to phrases like that, it's not a coming out of a feeling of love. It's coming out of a feeling of I'm taking energy from you mm. and I expect you to pay up. Usually the pay up from I told you so is you're supposed to feel shame. Yes. Yes. And in a, in a sense of, of just, you know, you haven't met the expectation. Well, you're supposed to surrender to me because now this proves that I know better than you. I know better than you. And it's just, it's a power play. This is also a very good point. I wanted to, to, to let's talk about this for a second. There's something else if we get to it. Um, but but the ego is on a power trip. It's a power play. Um, 
the ego doesn't negotiate with you and say, is this a good time to have an emotional reaction? No. The ego doesn't even, sometimes it demands, but the, the ego will will take you over without a thought, without a, uh, without a shred of remorse or a second of consideration. You could be doing something that's really important, delicate work, really, you know, somebody you really love and you care about, and, and you get yanked away by the ego, and the ego does not care. That child who needs you to be their parent sees you as a crazy, screaming person, you know, is, is, is crying and wounded, and you're doing terrible things to them at the moment, but you don't care. The ego does not care. The ego's getting its attention. And you're screaming and yelling and carrying on. And this child is, you know, crying on the, on, uh, across the room because they see someone they love acting in a, in a, as an insane person. You would never do that consciously. You wouldn't walk up to someone you love and start to hurt them and make them cry. But you will do it in an instant with the ego because the ego does not care about that. No, it just wants what it wants wants what it wants and uh believes that as long as it gets what it wants it was justified in its action regardless of who has to pay for it yes it doesn't believe that it has, should have any repercussions from it no. because it was right so you sit there and you go no yeah the, the, it was right is the right of of you know, a Genghis Khan, I'm more powerful than you, so therefore it's right. I need this, so therefore it's right. You know, and we're familiar with that, but, but the consequences can be lasting. You can say something in anger and in unconsciousness, which will transfer a fragment of this horrible ego, which is driving you into another and becomes mm. their trauma. Mm. You can do something which you will regret for the rest of your life in an instant of ego-driven rage or fear or whatever it may be. These, these things are because the ego does not care. The unconscious, patterned, emotional parasite that, that drives this action. So when it rises up, you, you have to have enough space to sit back for just a moment it, it is really an instant of volition the heart can help here the heart is a spacious place and when things rise up if you consult the heart say should i engage in this you, you, you need to be disciplined to even begin to set that up you do you okay do. because most of the time people are not aware they think it's a direct to drive. It's never a um, half a breath. Take a deep breath and you pause. That's the beginning of it. Mm. You must be able to pause before you say anything. And that requires a lot of self-discipline and practice. If you must remove yourself from the situation, then that's what should be done. But these skills are, aren't always taught to us when we're young. Oftentimes not. Uh, and, and, and like many things, people have to go through with their egos a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, the Buddha says all life is suffering. Well, in totally ways, <laughs> his way of putting it is that your ego will cause you to repeat repetitively walk through suffering until you realize that that's enough. That's the end of it. You, and, and that's the beginning. You know, you need to then practice to remove the ego's food. Uh, you need to um, put yourself into a conscious state habitually and then realize that, that there's the ego who can't... Uh, I, this is the point I wanted to get back to. You mentioned it earlier. And I wanted to ask you this question. Why can't the ego live in the present moment? I, I, I want to hear your take on that. The why can't it live in the present moment? Because? It has to do with the flow of energy. Most people 
when they create the ego, will only use uh, the mental part as well as the emotions behind it. Because when you think of it as a developmental thing, as a small child, you go through your experiences and then suddenly you have an emotion and it didn't feel good. And because it didn't feel good, you didn't want you don't want to experience that again. Normal. But then the training that comes up or the habit form that comes up is that you have to analyze it and and make sure that the situation won't rise again. Problem is the initial experience where that voice said I told you so, comes in. That is loaded with a charge. That charge is what gets passed down in a family. It's a a frequency of, um, how do I say this? It's a, an authority or authoritarian voice that's basically telling you you should feel this way. You should be ashamed of yourself over this. And so you were, you do feel ashamed at that point because that's what you were told. This is the response. So when you hit a point like that again, you immediately go into that programming of, oh, I don't want to feel ashamed again. And you'll do anything you can to try to avoid getting put into that moment which means that you're not engaging in the moment of now. It means that you're using all the mental and emotional aspects of yourself that created that moment. And you can't step out of that bubble. Hmm. That bubble was created when you were young and given to you to make part of you. And it's a of a learning thing that we have, all of us have, where um, and it's like a shortcut method so that we can survive in this world. Well, we do it this way. This is what we've done. But when you realize that it's tearing you to pieces because the ego has suddenly become inflated to the point where it's figured out that it can get more attention if it just continually brings you to this memory. Let me bring you to this memory. Keep feeding me. Let me bring you to this other memory. Keep feeding me. It's you got to get to the end of that saying, okay, that's enough of this. I, I, th- I think you're, you're absolutely right. But I think in, in, one of the ways to get to the end of the ego and the practice part, practice part, um, you, you, if you, expand yourself into the moment of now it it does quiet the mental it does it makes the ego voice stop um totally talks about it being you know if you are suddenly given something which is an overwhelmingly beautiful thing a sunrise a sunset the sea oftentimes these larger than life the sky things um awe they they bring in a sense of of silence and wonder and, and such great vastness that they silence the ego for a moment. But you don't need these things. The ego doesn't, it, it can't, and you said this before, if you give it a big enough thing, it doesn't know what to say. It kind of shuts up. It doesn't have any way to either name it or or talk about it or bring you out of it. And so the the vastness is too big for the ego to... It wants to. It wants to say, well, this, I like this. I don't like this. But if you give it something so so immense and so um, vast, all at once, or you just expand your awareness all at once so that the, the voice kind of goes, mm, mm, I don't know what to say. And the emotions go, mm, no, one's, no one's making me come up. I don't know what to do. And the whole thing goes quiet. And it becomes so vast that the ego is put in its place. You said that before. It has a place. It, it's small and it becomes a, 
a useful thing rather than a parasitic thing? What normally happens is you want to put a, a handle on what it is. And when you put a handle on what it is, it ends. Yes, and so guess what? We have to end this right now. So I'm Michael Lyons. We went over again. I'm Margaret, and thank you for listening. (laughs) 